talking about something that's close to my heart, which is emerging technologies and Baltic regional security. Terrific. Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. It's a wonderful opportunity to come back to Canada. Indeed, I'm presently based at City University of London, but I'll be coming back to Canada on a more permanent basis because I'll be taking up a position at the University of Waterloo in just a handful of weeks. So it's going to be good to be back. But uh, I'm also a non-resident fellow of the Modern War Institute, so I guess the usual caveats apply is what John just uh, had mentioned at the outset of his presentation. So none of what... Um, I'll say represents in any form um, the views expressed here of uh, the U.S. Army or the U.S. government or what have you, the Pentagon. So I'm going to be talking about emerging technologies and how they might shape deterrence and defense initiatives in the Baltic region. So it's going to be a little more forward-looking than some of the presentations we've had so far, especially on this panel. Many observers argue that we stand on the precipice of a new industrial revolution, whereby robotics, artificial intelligence, as well as 3D printing, might affect not only business practices or the global economy, but also war and statecraft. And I think there are, broadly speaking, two perspectives on this particular issue. One, what's called the Hamas School of Thought, is that these technologies could generate many of the capabilities of the most expensive current systems at a fraction of the cost. So the implication for the Baltic countries is pretty good here. They can, in fact, maybe perhaps match Russia for much, rush, Russia. They can match Russia with uh, various capabilities in order to enhance um, their capabilities and so not rely on their allies especially the United States or other great uh, powers within uh, NATO. Another school of thought, however, argues that certainly new technology will diffuse within the international system, but only a handful of states, really the elite states, and really at that, the United States, will truly benefit from leveraging these sorts of technologies to achieve some sort of military effectiveness. And so with respect to the Baltic region, it's a bit of a wash. It's not entirely clear if this argument is correct, what will be the uh, net uh, benefit, if any. And indeed, my argument in a nutshell is more or less just this, that we should not, pardon me, overestimate uh, the impact of these emerging technologies. But they might indeed help uh, defense and deterrence initiatives in the Baltic region in the long term. So, Without further ado, I think it's important to talk through some definitions just to get us all on the same page as to what these par particular technologies mean. So to borrow from the Defense um, Science Bureau um, uh, definition of autonomous systems, the DSB being at the Pentagon, to be autonomous, a system must have the capability to independently compose and select among different courses of action to accomplish goals based on its knowledge and understandings of the world itself and the situations. And there are lots of benefits uh, that we believe can accrue from adopting robotics or autonomous systems more largely. They may be more reliable, and indeed, human beings, surprise, surprise, are pretty terrible at making decisions, whereas Artificial intelligence or robotics might be much better and might be less impeded by various cognitive or psychological biases um, and so forth. They also improve reaction times. Humans are slow. Machines can be much faster. They also could reduce personnel burdens at the cognitive and physical level. They might, and this is why I think we get um, uh, our common understandings of, of um, of robotics, at least uh, from popular media um, here, more mass and more saturation. We can envision killer robots, so to speak, uh, being able to crowd out a battlefield, mass firepower and saturated environment, overwhelming enemy forces and so forth. And lastly, another benefit is that robots or automated systems might just be more survivable, that we can send certain robotic machinery into environments that might be uh, very uh, hazardous to humans uh, for a variety of reasons, and so uh, we can maybe engage in more difficult or more dangerous missions. But I want to stress that 
at least as far as I can see in the next few decades, there'll be much less of this, which is again, consistent with our popular understandings of military robotics, and a little bit more like what we see here in this photo taken from an Amazon warehouse. What's interesting about this warehouse is that it, we see dis goods being distributed at a very different uh, process than what, has, what we have seen so far for much of the last hundred or so years. Typically, goods would move through a distribution center, thanks to conveyor belts and human operators. But in this Amazon warehouse, the process is much different. An order is entered, a software identifies a bot that's closest to a bin where that product that is ordered is located. The bot retrieves that good and uses sensors and various navigation codes around the floor to avoid clotting with other bots, retrieves the product, and then carries it to a human collector, and so forth, thereby sort of t taking out um, the human element, at least until the very end. And this leads to greater efficiency uh, within the distribution process. But beyond the warehouse, we're also seeing other ways in which artificial intelligence and robotics can streamline various organizational processes. There is, for example, the possibility of anticipatory shopping. Right now, the business model for much of um, the last 100 years has been for shoppers to shop and then for shipping to happen later, meaning that customers will have to express their wants first, they have to go to a site, collect the goods, and so forth. But perhaps with anticipatory shopping, we can, we can imagine what consumers really want before they in fact know what they want, get goods to them before they in fact start shopping. And we can imagine certain military applications in so far as ammunition, medical equipment, medicine, and spare parts could be delivered um, without us being able to put in a sort of order um, because frankly the analytics would sort of identify these needs at the outset. The other emerging technology is that of 3D printing, which I'll talk a little bit less about in this presentation, but I think is important to mention because it's often uh, lumped together with those other emerging technologies. 3D printing involves the use of computing technologies to join materials together so as to produce three-dimensional objects. And like with uh, robotics and autonomous systems, there are a number of possible benefits here. There are fewer machine constraints on designing products. You know, there are lots of things we like to design, but we cannot because the machines that we use to build those very products sort of constrain our ability. But that might not necessarily be the case with a 3D printer. Complexity usually would come at a price, but now with 3D printing, that might not necessarily be the case. Complexity might become cheap. Products are often made for inventory, but we might in fact envision a scenario where we can make products based on demand. This might be especially useful uh, for military purposes. And finally, there might be less waste. Rather than um, putting in a bunch of materials and only use a fraction of them in the final product, we can actually uh, lower the waste that um, comes out of the process. And perhaps I think most importantly, at least with respect to um, uh, for basing, and this is something I'll to discuss, there might be much less reliance on supply chains. Indeed, uh, we can maybe envision uh, changes in the global economy being such that the United States and other major and advanced industrial uh, countries do not necessarily rely on uh, supply chains involving um, far-flung regions of the world, but might be able to domesticate manufacturing processes at home with the use of these printers, which could have major um, repercussions for economic interdependence and so forth. So with those definitions in mind, what I'll do for the next few minutes is talk about how the US Army, the Russian Armed Forces, and the Baltic states are grappling with these emerging technologies. Certainly the US military takes seriously these emerging um, technologies, but the U.S. Army uh, admittedly has been a bit uh, reluctant or more cautious about uh, military robotics and artificial intelligence, not least because of their experience in 
Iraq, where they used um, uh, the Talon swords as well as the Mark bots, and those robots suffered from glitches. In the case of the Talon swords, they were even misfiring. And so there has been a bit of trepidation. But now, uh, given that we're in this new era of strategic comp uh, competition and that we're seeing countries like China and Russia make investments in these sorts of technologies, the U.S. Army has sort of woken up, woken up and realized that it needs to catch up. And so just last year, it issued a report on robotic and autonomous systems. But what's interesting is that, at least in the short to medium term, the focus of the U.S. Army is mostly on increasing um, situational awareness, lighting the physical and cognitive workloads of military personnel, and improving logistics distribution by use of military robotics and artificial intelligence. So it's not so much the case that they're building robots to, you know, as killer robots and deploying them on the battlefield. That might be a possibility several decades hence, but that's not at least what I see the Army thinking about these issues uh, in the short to medium term. With respect to 3D printing, as I indicated just a moment ago, it could affect forward um, basing in the sense that um, forward deployed uh, personnel might not necessarily have to rely on, on uh, supply links as much as they used to if they can uh, replenish spare parts, medical equipment on the spot. Um, and this might indeed have implications um, if there are concerns of forward deployed units uh, being uh, enveloped or, or surrounded by adversarial forces should that ever come to pass. What is potentially interesting is um, whether there's a bit of a double-edged sword at work here. Now, we've already talked a bit about deterrence and what makes up successful deterrence. Credibility is obviously a key ingredient. And the way I think about credibility is that it's a function of both ability and willingness. Are you able to follow through on the threats or promises that you issue? Are you even willing to execute those threats and promises even if doing so comes at a certain cost? And certainly we can see military robotics and artificial intelligence enhancing deterrence by denial in, in the sense that it might impede the uh, ability of the adversary to achieve objectives on the battlefield. And so deterrence by denial could certainly be enhanced with increased firepower, situational awareness, and mobility of local forces. However, we might consider there being a situation whereby, you know, military footprint on an ally so soil might be smaller. And for better or for worse, allies like to have large military footprints. It's symbolically important. It's politically attractive to them in some cases. And so they might not necessarily see uh, the benefits uh, um, with respect to deterrence by denial in the same way as we do. And so there might be um, a, a paradox at work here. What of Russia and its uh, approach towards emerging technology? Vladimir Putin famously uh, did say that whoever becomes the leader in artificial intelligence will become the ruler of the world. I'm not entirely sure what exactly he means by this, but certainly we do see the Russian Ministry of Defense make acquisition of military robotics a key priority. And so we've seen a lot of effort uh, to develop those sorts of capabilities. And indeed, in the last few um, months, you might have seen pictures of this small robot tank, the Narekta, uh, being uh, showcased in various uh, Russian uh, military uh, footage. So far, at least uh, tactically, um, Russia has used unmanned aerial vehicles, <coughs> albeit to a limited extent, in Ukraine and Syria. Now, the drones that Russia has are not the sorts of drones that the United States has. It doesn't really have anything that comes cl even close to the Global Hawk or uh, the MQ-9 Reaper. Most of their unmanned aerial vehicles uh, are, have been useful for artillery spotting as well as for making post-damage assessment. It's not entirely clear whether they actually have any strike capabilities. Maybe they do, but I'm, 
I'm not aware of uh, any widespread use of those particular capabilities in Ukraine and Syria. And indeed, part of the reason why uh, we might not have seen such capabilities from Russia is that because they're really, really difficult to make. And certainly the United States has an advantage because has been working on these technologies for decades now. Only after the Russian-Georgian War in 2008 did Russia start thinking seriously about these sorts of technologies. So despite all the noise that R the Russian Ministry of Defense is making with respect to robotics, I would argue that they would still have a long way to go. And with respect to 3D printing, we do see Russians make some strides in this area. For example, they 3D printed a T-14 main battle tank. That seems pretty cool. But at the same time, they are facing high costs and pretty severe production constraints. So it's not entirely clear to what extent 3D printing would really help. Now let's talk about the Baltics, because this is where ultimately things come together. So the first point of departure for me, of, of course, when I ever talk about the Baltics, is that this is a region where we observe a massive imbalance of power. Certainly, if you look at uh, this chart, you can see um, how Russia has a number of aerial and maritime assets in Kaliningrad, as well as ground assets uh, all along the, the length of the Western Military District, with many forces concentrated uh, in that corner of Estonia closest to Latvia. And certainly, La you know, those three countries lack their own air forces. Between them, I think they have maybe 30,000 soldiers, whereas th um, the, uh, the Russians certainly have a lot more. And the other fact that uh, is worth uh, stating here is that the Baltic countries do have Article 5 commitments. And I think uh, as much as we tend to view Article 5 commitments as being inherently problematic from a Western, Western perspective. Uh, Russians take the Article 5 commitment quite seriously. One of the reasons why they engage in these sorts of hybrid tactics is precisely because they think uh, quite well of the Article 5 commitment. All this is to say that these sorts of Technologies might not necessarily matter because these are the two basic fundamental truths that abound in the region. But we have some reason to believe that they hold some promise for these three countries, as small as they are. And yet the embrace of these emerging technologies has been underdeveloped and uneven amongst the Baltic allies. Certainly Estonia leads the way. After all, it has embraced um, e-governance uh, in its in, uh, political institutions. And if you drive through the countryside of Estonia, you'll get 4G internet access wherever you are, no matter how remote you are. So certainly, they are making strides in this area. And they are thinking about artificial intelligence and what sort of legal frameworks are uh, useful for, um, for, for grappling with those sorts of technologies. But let's think about what these technologies can do with respect to the long and uh, long term first and then the short to medium term. Almost there. In the long term, certainly military robotics can compensate for their small size with firepower. You know, those are countries that are facing very severe demographic trends with low birth rates and high immigration and no immigration at that. So there is that. But in the short to medium term, I would argue that artificial intelligence can provide a lot of early warning. That this is a technology that can exploit certain home field advantage to address so-called little green men scenarios, right? So the home ground, the home terrain is familiar. You can collect lots of data on it. You can sort of understand what are regular patterns of behavior. And if you catch anything irregular or untoward that might suggest some sort of uh, little green men scenarios being afoot or in play, um, you can get early warning as such. Moreover, you can get, um, uh, you can leverage these sorts of technologies to improve ISR capabilities and logistics. With 3D printing, certainly, uh, if we think that insurgency is the most optimal strategy defensively for those three countries, then insurgents can certainly print weapon parts um, and, and make life difficult for a potential occupier. And four deployed forces might be able to rely less on supply chains uh, in the future should they remain there past 2020. 
So in sum, what I would argue is don't expect anything dramatic. The United States will likely lead in this area of technology, so although the effects of the security guarantees um, to countries like the Baltic states are a little unclear. But AI will be most useful for early warning, at least through the medium term. 3D printing can help sustain defensive operations. And because I'm running out of time, but it's worth uh, bearing in mind, you know, there are countermeasures that are possible here. And this is why I think things will become a wash. Right? You can hack into 3D printers. You can make AI uh, generate faulty or bad predictions. Right? But those are, again, countermeasures that we can leverage too, not just Russia. Thank you.